Hello everybody and welcome. My name is Julie Mann and I show men and women how they can create healthy, happy, sustainable lives. And I'm really excited because today I'm joined by Bonnie McCulley. Hi Bonnie. Hi Julie, I'm so grateful to be here today. It's great to see you. So for those of you that don't yet know who Bonnie is, she is a chaplain and founder of Your Sacred Power. So before we kind of get into the nuts and bolts mm -hmm. of that Bonnie, Tell us, did you grow up with a, a family who had a strong faith? Well, not exactly. No, my mother changed. Uh, I think they were Methodist and then they um, went to be Catholic. So I had that background, but yeah, I went to church, you know, Sundays and my mom had a rosary. My dad didn't go. So now not a strong background, but I had a just this inner um drawing i guess i guess say that there was something more at a very young age of course i didn't understand it but i was one that would go out to the woods and just climb a tree to experience um, nature and wind and i found there was a presence there and that spoke to me i think i was nine years old i could remember that you know getting out of somebody arguing or issues i'd go to the woods and I remember in second and third grade, I loved to go to church and lay in the back pew, a Catholic church, because there was this mystical experience. I didn't understand Latin back then, whatever that was, but I knew there was a, something beautiful and safe in this place. So my mom, mom thought I was crazy when I was six years old. When I'm, what are you going to 6 a.m. mass before school when you're only in third grade? Yeah, that was a little crazy, but something called me, just wow. called me. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Was there ever a time that you questioned the existence of a God? Oh, gee, I think when I was older, because we begin I, with that young age, I just knew something was there. I didn't understand everything. I didn't know theology, but it was this presence. And I always talked to Jesus on this personal level. I had a little script, I mean, in my room, I had rituals and I just trusted that Jesus was listening to me as a friend. So it wasn't a God up there in robes that pictures I saw, I didn't go there. I think you begin to doubt things when you get much older. When you, when I, uh, you go and you, you study intellectually and you get out of your heart and you, oh, well, you're comparing this. Is there a God? Well, how many, you know, you're just asking those deeper questions, which is good because I felt in doubt, there is a stronger faith. You need to question and then drop back into your heart and experience the spirit, experience the divine. That's when I know there's something much more then this little brain here can <laughs> synthesize or totally understand. So I think more people have to, it's the experience, but doubt is healthy. It's healthy. Yeah. I think as human beings, it's normal, isn't it? To doubt. Yes, and Ab absolutely. Yeah. So talking about beliefs, other beliefs, really, were there any beliefs that you inherited from your family as you were or from school or your peer group, whatever, that um, really you found perhaps later on in life were limiting? Oh, yes. I <laughs> hate to say growing up in a Catholic school. <laughs> I think that's where I received a lot of my um, limiting beliefs and a lot of pain. I remember, and these are traumatic events that we have to heal. And they block us from a young age. You don't even think they do, but they're deep seated in our brains and our bodies. I, one time a sister took me into her office and I think it was seventh grade. And uh, I was kind of interested in this boy or something. I don't know, I met him after. And she said, you know, uh, and when you have a barrel of apples and there's a rotten apple at the bottom, bottom of that barrel, you know what happens to the rest of the apples? I said, they get rotten. Yes. 
So I took that, I was a rotten apple. And so I wasn't good enough. And I can remember too in school, if I answered a question, you had to be exact, you had to be rote. You had not even miss a the in the sentence because you would get your knuckles hit or yelled at. And I had a very traumatic event where um, a sister ripped out earrings. Yeah, but, and, and, and that's not everybody. It, it was just those few things took away all the wonderful things that I knew God loved about me. It's like it didn't compute. And so you carry that along thinking, I can't speak up. Oh my God, I think somebody will put me down or I'll be wrong. Um, or I'm not good enough or I don't really matter. I, 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 I can't have friends. So that carried a long time in my life, you know, this inner like self, lower self-esteem. But, um, and, and sometimes wondering how much does God really love me? I really wanted to believe that and I sensed it, but sometimes I had those doubts too. Uh, am I good enough still? Am I good enough? So I had to do a lot of healing. Yeah, I think though that's quite a, a common limiting belief that people have that they're not good enough, yes. they're not worthy, they're not lovable, yes. something along mm -hmm. those lines. I think that's quite mm -hmm. common. And, and it comes from anybody. Teacher, yeah, and all of us have that kind of experience that you had, which sounds pretty dramatic and um, and yes. traumatic, like you say. So, mm -hmm. how did you actually deal with it at the time, apart from maybe thinking all those thoughts and thinking perhaps? Yes. Yeah, well, when you're younger, what you try to do is be the good girl. So that was my title. Um, let me try to be the good girl, be perfectionist, be giving, um, so that I could score, you know, the points and be loved. So of course in childhood and I had success. I, and I had wonderful parents. My parents did love me. I know that they weren't as there, they were working hard, but they had me in um, plays. They had me uh, be on stage. I was the youngest toe tap dancer. I played music. They had me in the arts. I was a solo singer, dancer, tap dance, all those beautiful things. And at 16, I was a beautician. So they drew these good things out of me. And so I, I could feel good about myself. So it helped that. But underneath, there was always, hmm, can I do more? I'm still not good enough. I can't go to college. I don't have the brains. In high school, I didn't think I was smart enough. So I'm going to do the good thing. And that was, hmm, get married young, because that was expected. Have children and be home. Expected. And that wasn't my true calling and self. It was okay, but something more, again, was calling forth. You got to be doing more. There's more to you, Bon, more to you. And it took me a while to figure that out, um, this longing and yearning, and I hmm, didn't know how to answer that. So Christ Street, there was this retreat at a church where I was, and um, I kept seeing it. In the bulletin, Christ renews his parish. And there's that, mm, I think I should go. I was working in a hospital, finally got a job as an admitting officer. And all these people were sharing feelings. I didn't know my feelings, only bad and good. And everybody would share. I'm like, what is this? And eventually I went on that retreat. That was a transformation that changed my whole life by answering that call. So did that actually change the, you know, the fact that you were married, your whole kind of circumstances, or it just changed the way you felt? It changed everything. First, um, it changed me because during that weekend, it brought more feelings up. And I found people wrote me letters and you do that like on the third day. And I didn't know people loved me. Holy cow. I wept. I, I just found forgiveness. I was on this of such love that my whole body was healing. Mind, body, spirit. I could feel this whole shift. And I can also see when I was meeting people afterwards, I would look them deep. I could see their soul. I could see what was needed to be healed. So there was, then it shifted into 
um, doing another one and leading the next one, which me, who am I to lead? Holy cow, and facilitate this. And at that retreat, I found more gifts that I had in leadership and I had a physical healing. So I had to witness to that. I, my life was changing and I knew I had to give these gifts to the world. I had to go back to school. I had to become me. Now that did not work very well. <laughs> With your husband. <laughs> right. And family. Oh, who is this person that is wanting to go to school? Oh no. Work and be some no, no, that doesn't make sense. Even my dad would say, You want to become what? A spiritual director and a counselor? What's that? I didn't know at time at that time what a chaplain was. I just wanted to be, I knew a counselor because I was as a beautician at age 16. Many people would say they were 40s and old. Oh, you have such insight. Oh, you should be a counselor, psychologist. I'm like, oh no, I'm too dumb for that. Oh no, I can't go back to school. And I knew there was something there. And then after that retreat, about a year later, I knew in my heart, if I did not move forward and be true to this calling, whatever this is, and be, be authentic in who I am and share my gifts, I was going to die. Internally, my soul would wither and you would hit this wall. It's like I, I was even paralyzed. I don't go forward, I'm not going to be worth anything. I can't be caged in. And that was the riskiest thing because what I wanted was my husband to support this. I wanted him to go back to school. I wanted him to grow. Um, I thought I saw the wonders of beautiful things we could do in our lives. Mm. So that's when all the breakdown happened and my life seemed to crumble, but I kept going. I knew that I had to keep going. And so I found a new job. I, I went to school. I kept, people helped me. I got, you know, um, scholarships. I had professors that saw what was in me. I went to school initially and I thought, I get A's. I'm pretty smart. <laughs> <laughs> there is this there is this giftedness in me somehow and um yeah and I was angry at God at the time I worried I felt all the things that people do and they step forward in transformation when it, you have to be bold and true um you feel abandoned you wonder where God is you call me to this now where are you and who's going to help me I have no money. I have kids. How am I going to make this? My family doesn't even understand this. And um, it came through. I would wail at night. I would do my crying. I would do my journaling, all the things I needed to do. And I kept one foot forward knowing I had to do it. And I said when I left the hospital as an admitting officer, registering people, to continue this, I said, I'm going to come back here in a leadership role. That's when later I did go back. And that was after I got my BA in um, religious studies and a BS in psychology, because my new back then, way back then, we needed to bring spirituality and psychology together. Always knew it before it was even a thing. And um, then I found this program as a clinical pastoral education program to be a chaplain. So people said, oh, just take one unit, take one thing, and then expand uh, your experience and see what this is about. And that, again, changed my entire life to become a chaplain and eventually the assistant director of spiritual care at that hospital. Wow. So what I prophesized when I left came true. Fantastic. So that was indeed a really courageous step to go against 
your husband and your family. So did you feel ostracized at the time? Yes, I really did. I did not have the support. So, um, and, you know, going through divorce and trying to negotiate all of that and his family, you know, not happy with things. Nobody was. So I did. I felt alone, lonely. And one time so deep, I think it was the dark night of the soul. I really did. Cause I was losing entire hope I was working in this, oh, office where, you know, you have tons of people, I'd like a temp, all these secretarial things typing it's like this is not who I am I'm not even a beautician creating I was like I it was such a heaviness I would go home and one night I said I I just I can't go on and I really considered giving up everything and even considered like I'm going to end up in a psych unit if I don't do something maybe I should just leave it all then this beautiful scent came into the room of roses and saint Teresa of Lisieux in the catholic tradition i used to hear people witness about her when they would pray to her and roses would come into the room and i think whoa and then that's my confirmation saint and then i said that's her and I smelled these beautiful roses and it gave me the courage, the strength, and the knowing that God is with me and I'm not abandoned, keep moving forward. And um, people would come into my life or money would come into my life or profess. So you would think you have nothing and you can't do it. Putting my, keep putting my trust in God and saying, I need the manna here. That's how I talk to God. Okay, <laughs> come on, <laughs> man it today. I need it now if we're moving forward. And always something would show up, a friend, a person. And, and I, I connected with my sister and family there. Yeah, it wasn't like totally, you know, turned away. But you knew that you weren't understood. They wanted to love you and care, but they didn't understand um you were there i'd go to parties and things like that but you know um i had to go with um the spiritual community that was more of my family professors that understood what i was doing um backed me all the way uh you know like um religious uh communities and sisters i was a part of for a while they supported me and um just stay in that community. You stay in one, the people that will lift you up and carry you with along with you. And you help them too. That's how you get through. Yeah. And that's that's yeah. the same, I guess, in it with whatever we're dealing with, isn't it? When you have a religious belief or whatever. Right. Being around people that actually, you know, really love you as yes. you are and, and want the best for you. So you you mentioned, Bonnie, that you had this kind of calling. And that yes. you obviously, when you were a very young girl, you used to talk to Jesus regularly. Mm -hmm. um, but then there was this gap. You had the calling, and then there was a gap before actually you experienced the the roses and the. Did you feel? How long was the gap? And did you feel? And why do you think oh. there was a gap? And did you feel that? Um, you know that that when that came in, that that was that was it then, and and it was. That was your journey to have the gap where you couldn't hear anything and you couldn't have an yes I, I, yourself i believe that's really part of the spiritual formation whatever spiritual journey you are on we don't always have clear answers i don't today always get i would love that is it could you just be a little more clear uh, drop this down and some people get that easily but i think god or the higher power source whatever that is for you, allows you to work in the gap but i like god is distant i love that song i was thinking that uh, on it as a distance or whatever uh, that song was yeah uh you don't feel you don't feel her you don't feel the source because you have to struggle with sometimes this inner belief this inner thoughts, uh, more healing. And that is the wrestling 
that we all do on the spiritual journey. And I think then we find more clarity um, out of that. If God just gave you the answers or it was easy peasy, you would never grow spiritually. Yeah. <laughs> never. You know, I know God plants in us this desire to be loved, to be significant, to belong, to have security. Where are you finding it? You know, we all search for that. And for me, when I don't, I, I, I can't get it answered in things, uh, it draws me back to God to try to find this love, knowing I belong, knowing I'm secure, but I have to wrestle with it. Everybody does. I don't care if you're a Buddhist, Muslim, um, you know, Christian, whatever that is. You have a human, human, if you just believe in, in the humanness, you wrestle and then you go deeper to find that inner healing, to find the freedom, inner freedom that we all, you know, desire yeah. in our journey. You so see, it's like this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a roller coaster. So you can't be on the mountain all the time. You got to yeah. come down. <laughs> you, you say the state of your soul affects the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. what do you mean by that oh that's the I have found in my 30 years working with patients of all faiths because I I know of all faiths and I've experienced many um that when I would go in or even my own soul the soul uh, if it feels like it's languishing it feels withering that's when we're feeling down sad alone uh, the light isn't strong and i would say in the hospital if this person loses this last flame which is hope it's time they won't come back they'll be moving on and they would if i could touch the soul and i mean go deep into what is blocking the light in your healing and you might have a, that physical pain, physical healing. You might even be ready to go home to source divine God. And patients, when I would work with them using guided imagery or going deeper into their background, you know, what hurts? What are you worried about? What needs forgiveness? What are the blocks? Is it relationships? And so when we can shine a line or I can shine a light into that, and they can release whatever that is or clear it. The whole face transforms. I would see pain decrease, medications change, and sometimes just total healing. Even with energy, I could go in and say they're ready. The, the doctor would say they're ready to be going. I don't know if they're going to make it in the morning. That's how serious it is. So I would go in, not even knowing faith but knowing and reaching into the soul. So there's something about, they call me a soul illuminator. So I can connect deeply. Where is it? How is it? How strong is it? And send energy that could be laying of hands. That could be Reiki. That could be energy, the chakras. I work with all of that to line that up. I reconnected healing. I've done that. And I allow that to flow into the body to bring light into the soul and allow it to flow from head to toe and allow the divine or source to do the healing and even unconsciously i could talk and can hear me is look for the light allow the light let go of any pain let go of any hurt you are whole that would change i would go back the next day and the doctors sometimes would be, what happened here? I knew. I could just say, oh, I had some prayer with, with this patient. And just kept them in prayer, lifting them up. And they were like, wow. So not all the time, but powerful times. Um, even when they were ready to cross over. Crossing with wholeness and healing and light. Transformation at all levels at any level. So healing the soul, if I reach in there, healing the soul impacts the mind, the body, and the spirit. So the spirit could find the healing 
the mind might need the healing of limiting the beliefs and letting go of things and thoughts and worry, you know, um, or the body will transform and shift. Like when I healed, my warts went completely away within one hour. Wow. It's, it's, it's the soul good. work. It, it, it sounds amazing, Bonnie. And for some people watching, I'm sure it'll be really difficult for them to get their head around that. You know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So have you got any stories to actually illustrate something so you can be really, really specific about a particular person that you've worked with that, that may be in a language that um, people, some people watching may find more accessible? Well, even in my own body, that's how I know it works. When I go on retreat or I connect with the divine source or I do the energy work and I do breath work. So I apply all of these things to my own life. So whenever I have that deeper transformation in my soul and release things, just, um, oh, like recently um i couldn't here's an example i in my own life i couldn't speak up in meetings now a lot of people have that you know how you get anxious it's like i, I can't get my words out but then somebody over there says the same thing and you're like dang i had that why didn't i speak up what is blocking this and so I did this inner healing work and I brought Jesus in and someone did that with me and just simply showed me what uh, the episodic event was so it could be healed. And it was, and all of a sudden I just had this transformation and insight. And I knew this situation before, like the teacher choking me and that, well, I understand that would connect, right? No. It still was in the cells and it still needed a healing. And I had to bring in the divine Jesus or whoever that is for you to look at it and bring healing in it, even for that person who did it for me, to me and for me. I was able then to go back. And from that point on, I could speak up in groups. I could speak up in when I had doctors and ethics committees and all those important things where you feel like, oh, they're so, so much smarter, uh, doctors and that. Yes, I've never had a problem since in speaking up like that. Uh, so it again was another layer that just needed an inner healing from my soul of forgiveness and seeing it differently to release it again. So it's not like sometimes a one time thing. We have to like, okay, and then God pe peels another thing. We've got to look at it again and release it. So whatever it is, it's subconscious and you're not always aware that that's what's blocking you. And if, um, for example, for uh, someone in healthcare that was uh, in extreme pain, extreme pain, and uh, he was on hospice and they were taking him to the hospital and uh, to do, what can they do for this person? I Something made me go, again, the voice, and say, you better go see this patient before the other one. So I went there, and he couldn't speak. And so all I could do is say, I didn't even know all of his faith. I, I just knew it was Christian. I said, do you have things that you would like to let go of and forgive? And he would just, he just did this, shaking his head. I said, okay, let's gather, I don't want you to work, gather all of them, all of those things that you want to let go of and forgive and put them in a basket. I want you to imagine that. Now let's take it and put it in the front of the cross, at the foot of the cross there. I just want you to release it up into the heavens with Jesus. It's gone totally. And you are loved and you are healed and forgiven. From that moment on, he had no pain none and the doctor's like again stunned because it was the deeper soul work of the i call it soul work the deeper inner healing we can understand something a self-limiting belief i get that yeah i understand it at this level i understand that it is impacting my heart and i'm kind of bound up and sad you know from this belief i don't know what to do with it but when i touch it at a deeper level and bring in the source the spiritual connection it releases at a whole different level too and 
things shift. And you don't even have to go into a whole deep story all the time. Mm. It just changes. Brilliant. Well, what would you say to people who they don't believe in God and they actually really want some proof? Mm -hmm. Well, it's all in experience, trusting what's deep within, taking time to meditate, taking time to look at nature. When did you, I take people, when did you feel a peaceful moment? When did you feel some love? Just, you just knew you were so loved or maybe were you ever out in nature and you saw this, whoa, or the stars. I look at the stars, the pictures of the galaxy and I go, whoa, for me, there's something bigger. I might not be able to name it. And for some, it's like, you know, it's, it, I, I work with atheists or agnostics because you're a human being and there is something deeply inside of you, your intuition, there is love, there is a need to be loved and belong. And those to me are beautiful moments. They're for me, God moments, whatever you call them, they're special miraculous moments. You know, you can't find the words for it. It's a mystery. And I'm good with that because I always believe there's, there's something beyond us or something within, deep within that's guiding, that's loving you, that's helping you. And so I'm, I keep encouraging it, its experience. You can read all the books you want. You can study theology and argue all the points. Just take time and try to experience more of this deeper love, this mystery that is within you. And let's keep walking with that and seeing what you know then from this deeper level. Mm -hmm. If, if someone watching, Bonnie, is, is grieving mm -hmm. from the death of a loved one, maybe recently or maybe it happened years ago and they just feel in such pain and despair and it almost feels like too much to bear, mm -hmm. what would you say to them? Well, that is how that is to me, the gift of love. And that might sound crazy, but that's how much you loved someone. And they were so much a part of your life. They're never gone. But that pain is real. And that pain comes from so much loving that you had so many beautiful memories. And love never dies. There's always a connection. And I believe that they are connected. There is something beyond. And I have heard, even in my own life, stories that, that again, it's the stories of others and the experiences. That they're there, that they're, you can tap in uh, to their love, always in your heart, what you remember through rituals. And it's going to hurt a long time. It's, it's, and we all grieve differently. And two years from now, you'll have that pain in your heart because we miss them. But I know, and even if you don't believe something's beyond, it's just a mystery and amazing, the experiences people have. Pray for a sign. I just say, look for something. Say, hey, mom, dad, daughter, whatever. Let me know you're near. Sometimes they'll show you something that only you would know sometimes they will come in a dream that will give you peace. So when my dad died, it was terrible, so difficult. And I prayed and prayed and I wondered, is there heaven? I wonder, are you really there? Um, where are you after? Those say those questioning doubts, that's okay. And I said, well, let me know. So one day when he came, he came in a dream, all illuminated, came forward into my mind and looked at me and he said I now understand what you are doing and I bless it wow. I like it was in my mind oh he didn't say it He's telepathy and then he turned away went back to wherever heaven golden then I found out every single person in my family, even my kids, everyone, when we were together at Christmas, had 
a visit from him almost at the same time. It gave me goosebumps. Oh, I was amazed. Now, the different, now my mom is gone and I have had no connection. But I trust something's happening for her and there will be. But everybody's different. Everybody, I've, I mean, hundreds, you can read the books on it, that um, they're there in a different dimension in some way. And when I study near-death experiences, those are the witnesses. When I work with people going over crossing, what they tell me they see and experience, that was a witness to me. I'm like, whoa, there's something much bigger than I can put words on or understand. That's the mystery. Faith is a mystery, you know. Yeah. Not going to have all the answers. No, no. <laughs> no way. I just know from experience and what other people have experienced and what's in my heart and soul that guides me and has given me life. Not perfect, not happy every moment, but a happiness that um, happy, just a contentment. There's an inner peace that um, even in the midst of sadness, even in the midst of this crazy world right now that we need to tap into. And we all have it. We all can access it. And you can name it what you want. Um, but I just suggest and encourage you, just do what you can to tap into this so that you can live a life that's, that's authentic and true. So my thing is living a soul embodied life means being authentically you, your true essence, because that's what will give you life. Live, live a wholehearted life, embody it. Um, now that's the ups and downs, the sadnesses, the joys, the doubts and the faith, all of those things about life. And um, surround yourself with healthy, wonderful people that like, um, Brene Brown would say that really know you, trust you, hold you up, and that they're in the arena there cheering for you. And uh, that will carry you through yeah, in your soul and in your life and here and after. So Great. it's a journey, journey. <laughs> what do you do, money when you're not working? Oh, I love to crochet. Then I, I would, I do love to sketch. So I'm going to do more of that, but I love to be in nature. So I swim anything that can connect me to nature. I just came back from a come away with me retreat where I was in Ohio with beautiful ponds and the lake and, and just grass and smelling the beauty of the air. That's as from a little girl climbing the tree. <laughs> <laughs> laying in a hammock like this that's where I'm at peace and find stillness yeah letting the stuff go away and finding stillness I connect with, with myself and with God yeah Great. one final question yeah. when you're no longer on this planet how would you like to be remembered oh as um Spirit, more like that spiritual mentor that has helped. I just, my joy comes from seeing people find transformation, experience transformation and new life. That, oh, she helped me find my true calling and live it. Not just find it, but she, she helped me step forward uh, in this new beginning and take hold of life. And yeah. So I wasn't dying over there. I am this new person, this new being, and I thank her for that. Wonderful. It's been such a joy and a, <laughs> a well, wow, and it's so fascinating to talk to you, Bonnie. So Bonnie McCulley, thank you ever so much. Oh, you're so welcome. This was a blessing for me. Thank you. <laughs>